Thank you very much uh, all for coming. Uh, we'll get straight into it because this man has to be uh, in television center very soon for the 10 o'clock news. Well, I've just been there for the 6 o'clock news. Yeah. And okay. for the news channel, and for BBC World, and for PM, and for BBC World Service. Right, well, uh, let's get stuck in. Uh, let's start from the very, very beginning. Uh, can I just say, I work for BBC Arabic. You're the Middle East editor. We thought we knew about the Middle East. We thought we could read the situation and see what's coming. But we yes. had no idea about the Arab uprising, did we? Um, I don't mind admitting to that. Um, at the, just after Mubarak fell, um, and I was sitting around in the, in, the, in the Marriott Hotel in Cairo with a few other journalists who cover the region. And we were, say, we were talking about this, and someone said, I think the guy um, from Newsweek said, you know, we, no one, none of us saw this, did we? And someone else who will remain nameless said, well, I had inklings. And he turned on this colleague and, and said, to, said, said to this, I won't even give away the gender, uh, said, did you write it? Did you write it? It doesn't count if you didn't write it. And uh, it, there was no written transcript, you know, no, there was no piece in the archives. And the only thing that, you know, the thing which actually makes me feel okay about the fact that I didn't see it coming is that Mubarak didn't see it coming, Assad didn't see it coming, Gaddafi didn't see it coming, and my sixth didn't, and the CIA didn't. So, and the State Department and the Foreign Office, and others. So I think that's okay. And, and actually looking back on it, we should have seen it coming. I think we all knew that some change was pending. I think we knew that people were desperate for change, but then there were some catalysts before. And I'm going to ask you the same question that people ask me. Why didn't it happen before? <clears throat> what was different this time? Certainly there were sparks. There were uh, oppression and repression. And we remember Hama in Syria in 1982 when people thought, you know what? This is going to make it. But it didn't happen. Why did it happen now? You know, there, there's... They got a critical mass together, a critical mass of people. Uh, the poor got involved. Uh, someone in Cairo said to me when the whole uprising against Mubarak was going on, um, and just as it was starting, he said, look, the proof of all this, whether or not it will work, will be, and he pointed to his watch, and he said, he said if it's just the Rolex Brigade from Zamalek, which is the posh part of it's the Kensington of Cairo, uh, he said, if it's just the Rolex Brigade who take part in this, we haven't got a hope. But if it's the poor people, then we have. A couple of hours later, I was, seeing, I was, I was in Giza seeing about 2,000 people attacking the police, practically dressed in rags. Be, you know, something like, for, well, 40% of Egyptians are illiterate. Something like 40% or some similar figure live on less than $2 a day and those people were getting involved. So I thought, hang on a minute, Mubarak's got a problem. But looking back on it, there were attempts as before, again in Egypt, in uh, Mahala, which is an industrial town in the Delta. Uh, there had been uh, a large strike, which was organized with social media. Um, there was an important Facebook page that was started. Uh, there was, which had got a lot of support, um, and there was an, a real a organized attempt then to try and start something a couple of years earlier, and it didn't take off. And I have to say, when I was going over, and I write about this in the book, you know, as I, when I was going over to Cairo, mm -hmm. I missed the Tunisian revolution because I was testifying against Radovan Karadzic in The Hague. Um, and, you know, it's, it's actually sitting there and seeing the, it's the third time I testified, and see, seeing the, um, you know, the terrible ghosts of the past there, Karadzic in, in the dock, uh, I not for one nanosecond did I think that before the, the end of, before the summer, Mubarak in a hospital bed would be, be in a cage in a Cairo courtroom in, in, a, in a police academy which was once named after him. Uh, you know, the ironies were so, you know, but looking back at it, you know, we should have seen it. Why? large number of young people. 60% of the population of the region is under the age of 30. People who grow more connected than any other previous generation. It wasn't so long ago, as you'll remember, that there was a time when 
Arab leaders could pretty much shut off a country. And they tried. They tried. They tried, yeah. And the, you know, in the time of Nasser, he could control the media, even early on in Mubarak's career. But it's not possible anymore. Uh, I, think, I think satellite television, pan Arab, Arabic language satellite television has made a massive difference. And that enhanced the copycat effect. I mean, I said to one of uh, Egypt's leading bloggers, how did all this spread? And he said to me, he said, well, you know, we saw Tunisia. Of course, we, you know, we've been trying for a long time. We, p people in the opposition, like myself, he said, we've been trying, but we have, weren't getting anywhere. And he said that um, he said, there's Tunisia, this small North African country that beats us at football. And, you know, we're Egyptians. You know, the Egyptians, they think they're very important. Of course, they, very, they are, if any Egyptians are present. And, uh, <laughs> and he said, and, you know, so they, could, they beat us at football. We thought they can't beat us at revolution. We're going to have to have a go, too. So the copycat effect, you know, people seeing it on TV and thinking we can do it, too, I think was very important. Well, we're, we're going to get to Egypt in, in a moment. But the start, the spark was in, in a small Tunisian town, as you write in the book. And, and this guy who started it all because of, you know, wh whatever, it's uh, in dispute what happened. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it was there said. Different, uh, different accounts. Uh, different accounts. Uh, you do mention that in the book. And you see that some people said uh, a female policeman slapped him and he's pride. And then, you know, you interviewed her and we interviewed her and she says she never talked. Yeah, she denies it, yeah. He denies it completely. So uh, it happened in Tunisia. Yeah. Would the Arab uprising have spread if it didn't happen in Egypt? I mean, Tunisia was a small country. Tunisia was the catalyst. But would it have spread if it just stayed in Tunisia and the next one was Yemen or something? Like Not that? in quite the same way. You know, you could see by the timing of what happened. You know, there was a period in February last year when, from our pers my perspective and the perspective of the BBC news machine, we hardly knew which way to turn because there was Tunisia, which was over pretty quickly, actually. Um, Mubarak, he went. Days. Yeah. And by you know, early February, he was gone. And you know, almost at that same time, just as it became clear that Mubarak was going when he hadn't quite gone, uprisings started in, in Libya, in Bahrain, they were very active. In Yemen, things were starting. Uh, and then not, very, not many weeks afterwards, it started in Syria. And you know, Egypt has a very special position. You know, it's, it's a, a quarter of Arabs are Egyptians. Uh, it has a well-known position as being a, a cultural and political capital, which actually under Mubarak, you know, the years of um, kind of moribund years under Mubarak, it had sort of lost in a way. Well, it stepped back from. But, you know, it reasserted itself back at the center. And I think people thought, my God, if it can happen in Egypt, it can happen anywhere. And I thought, actually, when I was going over uh, to, to Egypt after the, um, there were the police day, which was the Tuesday of the week of the Friday when they took over Tahrir Square, and there were some unexpectedly large demonstrations. I went over on the Wednesday, and I said to my kids, um, I said, look, I'll be back by the weekend, because there will be a big demonstration on Friday and the, they have a very active police state in Egypt and they will crush it and that'll be it. I'll be home by about Sunday. I only took three shirts. Uh, the, the laundry in the Marriott Hotel was very active while I was, while I was there uh, um, and I was away for a month or, or so, whatever it was, whatever it took and so I was very surprised that they, that they succeeded but they did. I think they were surprised as well. They were stunned. You, you know, so the organizers also of, the, of some of the early demonstrations were, because I quote them in the book, um, two people. One, someone who'd been involved in earlier demonstrations, said to me, he said, you know, uh, we, we, he was involved in the early Facebooking and, the, um, and the, the demonstrations on police day. He said, I thought that uh, it would be the same as usual. We'd get to where we were trying to get to, and there would be, we'd chant for 15 minutes, and then I'd, as usual, I'd be in the back of a police van getting kicked. And someone else said, you know, we, 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 we 
put out leaflets. We started in a poor area because we didn't know quite uh, how um, it was going to work, and we hoped that in a poor area people would, would be on the streets anyway. There's a huge street life in those places, um, and they would just join us spontaneously. But they were windy streets, so it was only when we got closer to the center of Cairo and saw the, one of the, down some of the long avenues, I looked back, and there were 15,000 people behind me. I thought, my goodness, we've got something. That was a very powerful moment in the book when that young lady, I think, she yeah. looked back. She looked she, back. She looked back and she saw thousands of people behind she her. Saw, she, she didn't even expect that. She didn't expect They didn't expect it. They didn't expect it either. And it's funny how, you know, critical mass builds. And I can't point to, I just think people had had enough. And I think that when it happened in Tunisia, people thought it was possible. But let's try and analyze. If, if Ben Ali hadn't run away. It would not have happened. I don't know. Nobody knows. Who knows? Well, let's try and analyze the impossible because I think it's very, very hard to analyze why it happened and why it didn't happen before. And I think this is the question that we get asked the most. You know, you mentioned that there's a large number of young people under 13 year old, but that's always been the case. So was it just the internet? Was it just social media that allowed them to have that voice heard and for the world? Because it's so easy to upload these images nowadays. Uh, well, was it just that? No, I think, I think, as I say, I think satellite TV is a very important part of it in terms of the copycat effect. But also, I think its economic factors are really important. Prices were really rising. Prices of food. People were getting discontented. Unemployment continues to be ridiculously high. And that means it doesn't just mean that you haven't got a job. I mean, there is no such thing as unemployment benefit. It means if you don't have a job, you're in trouble. You have to rely on your family, you have to rely on the wider support networks. And because those do exist in Arab countries, people are able to get by sometimes, but you know, it's, it becomes very tough. If you're a young man in your 20s in what are still traditional countries and you can't get married because you haven't got a job, you haven't got any money, you're never going to be treated seriously until that happens. You can't be a proper man. You can't grow up. Um, so there were those factors. There are other factors. You know, in Syria, they had a disastrous drought in the last, gosh, I mean, sort of five, six, seven years, which was exacerbated by the way that the government dealt with it. Subsidies to farmers meant that crops weren't grown in the right way. Uh, and if you look at the places where the armed uprising has really taken root, in Syria, it's either in places where the drought happened or it's in people were forced off the land and had to go and live. Uh, I mean, people talk about the suburbs of Damascus. And in, the, you know, in this country, when you think about suburbs, you think somewhere leafy and nice with hedges. And the suburbs of Damascus are absolutely hellish, uh, terrible concrete jungles. And people often displaced from the land have, were forced to go and live tough lives on the edge of Damascus, in the countryside of Damascus, you know, in the area, this sort of greater Damascus area. Um, and, and those people were absolutely uh, prominent, are continued to be very prominent in the armed uprising. Uh, so I think economic factors are really important. And they they fed in into it. So it all became, you know, it's a cliche, it all became a perfect storm. Um, and, and the thing that triggered it was Boazizi who, who was, seemed to be, he's an archetypal representative of this under 30 generation. It was interesting that early on in Tunisia, people, there were reports saying that he was a university graduate who uh, had to sell vegetables because he couldn't get a job. And everyone, you know, all university graduates identified with that. Actually, he wasn't. He hadn't even finished high school because maybe he would have got to university, but he, he had to go and sell vegetables and fruit because his, his family didn't have any money. And his father was dead, I think. So, uh, so he was supporting his family from a young age, but he got to his mid-twenties and he would just became an archetype in which people could, could identify with. And, and that was the thing in the end that made it happen. I remember I moderated a similar event for the Frontline Club. Uh, there was an Egyptian blogger sitting next to me and I, when I talked about the uh, wall of fear disappearing i mean yes. suddenly i think this was possibly the big possibly it's fair to say that the biggest reason was that they discovered that they can yeah 
despite all the other reasons that you mentioned, this guy, the blogger next to me, he said, we discovered that the wall of fear never existed. I think what he meant was we can overcome it. Yeah. And they discovered that they can. Would it be fair to say that that was the biggest thing, that they discovered that it's possible? That certainly happened in Tunisia and Egypt. Um, because <coughs> both of them had these very active police states. But what happened once the, the big demonstration started was that the army, which in both countries had an existence as an independent institution, and Ben Ali, even though he'd come from the army in, in Tunisia, president of Tunisia, even though he'd come from the army originally himself, he didn't trust the army, and he built up his own personal security forces. So the army wasn't the same thing as the regime. And in Egypt, the army certainly wasn't the same thing as, as Mubarak, even though Mubarak himself had come from the armed forces, from the Air Force. Um, and they positioned themselves effectively between the regime and the people and protected the demonstrators. Even if they didn't quite intervene on their side, they meant that it wasn't possible for massacres to take place. That was not the situation in Libya or in Syria. Uh, a bit different in Yemen, where the, the armed forces split, for, and it's quite complex reasons there. But, um, and so I think, that, therefore, that because those two came first, and there seemed to be for a while a sort of Arab, a model of Arab revolution. You occupy a central square. Uh, you just stay there, and the whole rotten edifice comes tumbling down as long as you push hard enough. And that's why people, you know, this phrase Arab Spring came up, and that's why, one reason I didn't use the title in my book, because I think it, there, are, you know, there are parallels with the Prague Spring in 1967, and by extension, the, the, the dominoes falling in the former Soviet Empire in Eastern Europe in 1989, which actually aren't very helpful now for the Middle East. It seemed that way at the beginning, when you know, it was Tunisia, then it was Egypt, and, we, and people thought, well, what's next? This will all be over by the summer. There'll be a whole new Middle East, but not at all. It's going to be a generation-long process of change. And as we're seeing in, e in, 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 in um, Syria, and we'd, we would have seen in Libya had there not been foreign intervention, there are people there, you know, the Assad and, and Gaddafi took the, um, their, what they took away from, from Tunisia and Egypt, the former, ba former ben fall of Ben Ali and the fall of Mubarak, was that actually force works as long as you use enough of it. And the problem that these guys had, they didn't have the guts to use enough. And if they had just got in there and broken more heads, killed more people, Ben Ali he should have run away. Mubarak was old; he lost his bottle, and and these guys were not going to do the same, make the same mistake. And so they took the gloves off from the very beginning. But like you said, there was a question mark over the armed forces whether they would have fired on protesters in Egypt and Tunisia. Well, they wouldn't uh, exactly. Or, or not. Yeah, because so even if the uh, the, the uh, Mubarak had would've. taken the yeah. decision and made the order to fire yeah, they at protesters. Well, senior officers in the Egyptian army have told me after the fact that they wouldn't have done it. Yeah. And one guy said to me uh, that he was talking about a, um, a guy in the special forces in, in Egypt. He told me that one of his colleagues uh, was in charge of the uh, presidential guard actually at the palace. And they, uh, at the time when Mubarak was about to fall, uh, he said there were big crowds outside. He said and he actually had told his men to unload their weapons. And he went and told the demonstration organizers he said, look, we've unloaded our weapons. We're not going to shoot you. You need to know that. In return, would you kindly not pass the fence? Because it's going to get awkward for us. And, you know, we're on your side. And they didn't. And so, and they calmed it in that way. But it's different in Syria. It's different, it was different in Libya, where there are people who were absolutely felt so identified with the regime. And you see this strongly in Syria, that people believe that if the regime goes, maybe they go. They'll be ended up. They'll end up standing out against this, being put put up against the same wall. And shot, and I'm certainly speaking to people in districts of uh, of of Damascus, uh, who work for the regime, Alawites who work for the regime, uh, poor people, not well educated, uh, who, who will say who said very similar things to me. You know, we have to we have to fight these Al Qaeda people because otherwise they'll kill us. And that's the message that it's a message from the regime. It's one they believe in. Well, the poor Syrians, they they didn't get the same same treatment from the armed forces. But what do you? Um, I think that's a very important point. That a lot of people in the West they think 
that the Arab uprising is one thing, the reasons for discontent are the same. There are common denominators, but yeah. every country is different. Yeah, it's a very diverse region. I, I think, you know, I hate these phrases like the Arab street. Uh, the Arab, you know, because it tends to, for me to suggest a kind of amorphous group of people who don't have individual names, probably punching the air and chanting, uh, no matter where you happen to be. And of course, it's, it's much more complicated than that. And, and it's, it's a very large area. You know, it, if you're in Tunisia and you're looking across, you know, Franco Francophone Tunisia, and you're looking across the Mediterranean, you feel quite a lot of the way to Europe. You go to, you go to Sana'a and you go to, to Yemen or you go to the southern part of Arabia. And well, in Sana'a, actually, you feel about you're halfway to the 16th century. A lot of the time in the old city, it's incredible. but. Um, so it's really very diverse. And so there are, there are individual reasons. There are some common denominators, as you say. I think economics is one. Fed, people being fed up with humiliation, fed up with corruption, fed up with having to live the way their parents did. And actually, because they're connected more to the world, knowing that it, you don't have to live that way. Did you find it hard to explain this to a British audience who probably looked it's at the It's a constant world. battle. It's really? a, well, no, because not because people don't want to understand, but because the, um, I mean, we've been speaking already for uh, half, an hour. half an hour, and we're just sort of scratching the surface. You know, we have, if I do a two-way on the 10 o'clock news, it's, if it's in the studio, it's rarely more than one minute, 20 seconds. If I do a package, a long one is, a long one is three minutes. Uh, you know, while the uh, uprising was going on in Cairo, I was doing four or five minutes a night, six minutes some nights, but that's exceptional. Um, so television, and I work also for radio and for our website, but television is an incredibly effective and expressive medium, and you can get an awful lot across in a very short time. However, it has its limitations. Uh, so I think you, you, from my point of view as a reporter, you try and build it up over a period you know, over a month or something, or a few weeks, build up. At least for those who follow. For those who follow, yeah. I mean, I think research has shown, actually, that even quite keen watchers of the 10 o'clock news only watch it once a week. <laughs> so, so what I take away from that, actually, is, you know, journalists always say, oh, no, you can't do that story because we did it last August. I think, <laughs> do it again, repeat it again, repeat things, do them again, do them, you know, as they say, what do they say? You say, you know, at the beginning of the piece, tell people what you're going to say, say it, and then say it again. Repeat it, yeah. Uh, yeah, because you have to keep coming back to some common points because it is quite complex. And, I, I, and in a sense, if people do want to understand what's going on in the region, they do need to do a little bit of work. You know, we have plenty of stuff on the on the on the website. Uh, there's no excuse. You know, but <laughs> <laughs> do your homework, and uh, we'll try and point people in the right direction. I think um, you're absolutely right in the sense that we can only scratch the surface. But, um, you know, the book does a good job of um, explaining things. And I, I have to say, I'm not plugging your book or anything, but I have to say, you know, I breathe. Please I do, work. though. Okay. Be careful. Here's the book. Um, I'm just saying, you know, I work with the Middle East. I work for BBC Arabic. I eat, I breathe. You know, I know. Yeah. And, and yet there are details in there which I found very useful. Let me ask one more question before we open it to, to these guys to ask you mm. whatever they want to ask you. Um, why did it not happen in other countries? And why is it that it seems that monarchies are immune? I think that all of the countries, all of the Arab countries, face similar pressures for change to a greater or lesser degree. And they have things in common, like young populations, unemployment, very often corruption, very often authoritarianism which people get fed up with. Um, I think you can see different categories. Republics with presidents, even ones where they're attempting to change them into hereditary presidencies, like Egypt, they were trying to do that. That was another <coughs> last straw, I think, for people. The fact they thought that, you know, they thought that, well, at least when that old so-and-so Mubarak goes, uh, we'll have a change. And suddenly his son, was being groomed to take Assad. over, yeah. you know, like Assad had taken over in Syria. And in, in Libya as well, Saif al-Islam was being groomed to take over from his dad. You know, that was 
was, seemed even worse. Was the but in monarchies, the last people accept that more. In well, monarchies? I think monarchies have more. So I think so. The, so the presidencies, I think they are more vulnerable in that sense, less legitimacy. Monarchies have more legitimacy. They tend to. They also are often sustained by a network of tribal connections, which helps to sustain them as well. Um, and also, monarchies and kings have prime ministers who they can sack. A thing that the, the Jordanian, Jordanian king does often is sack his governments, sometimes three times a year. Gets rid of prime ministers, blames them, and, says, and gives the impression <coughs> of change. Uh, and there's, I think there's a third category too, and that's countries which have actually had violent political events. I'm thinking of Lebanon, I'm thinking of Algeria, uh, where they had a very bloody civil war in the 90s, the Palestinians, uh, they've been quite cautious because they know that it, having upheaval is not necessarily a panacea, that things can go badly wrong. Um, and I think so, uh, the last thing I'd say on this point is that while the pressures for change are there in all the countries, the way that <coughs> countries react to them are different. And some of them on it, in the Gulf, I think, you know, if Bahrain. this... Bahrain, well they've been sustained by their Western allies and by their big brothers in Saudi Arabia and also the other rich countries in the GCC. Um, I, King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia indicated really that he, that, that he also believes that Saudi Arabia is vulnerable to these kinds of changes. When he came back to the country after Mubarak uh, was overthrown, and the first thing he did was magically come up with $130 billion to inject into wage subsidies, education, welfare, and plus, of course, there was more money for the secret police, um, because he knew that he had to try and buy off discontent, because Saudi Arabia, despite the fact it is a fabulously wealthy country, is a country that also has poverty in it, uh, because the, you know, their system is not at all fair. And I think they realized that they had to try and buy people off. How long will that last for? What happens when the king dies? He's about 90. What kind of succession are they likely to have? <clears throat> but I think what happened in Bahrain and what's happening today in Jordan possibly show that monarchies may be less likely to face this sort of upheaval, but it's not impossible. I absolutely don't think it's impossible, and Jordan is a good example. The Hashemites have always felt insecure. You know, King Hussein uh, one of the subjects of my books, uh, available in the corner, uh, there is a, uh, I, I wrote a book a few years ago about the 1967 Arab-Israeli war. And one of the reasons why King Hussein got involved in the war, and I had this from one of his main advisors, uh, was that uh, he said he, he, w he apparently went round the West Bank to Jordanian garrisons on the eve of the war, and he said, we're going to go through a war now, and we will probably lose a great deal but we have to do it, acquit yourself well, men. Why? Because he believed that he would definitely be overthrown by the Palestinian majority in the country if he didn't take part in the war. And he thought that if he did take part in the war, he might lose the West Bank, he might lose Jerusalem, but he'd probably be, because he was taking the example of 1956 when the Israelis were forced to give up what they'd captured uh, from the Egyptians by the Americans. He believed that something similar would happen a year or two after the war. And even though he'd lose them, he'd get them back. He was wrong. But it was a calculated risk on his point. So the Hashemites have always had this sense of weakness. And I think that that's something which now must be going through Abdullah of Jordan's head quite a lot. Especially today. The demonstrations seem to be getting bigger. Yeah, they're bigger. getting a little, they're moving, uh, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. Right. Any questions? Microphone coming. Um, thank you very much. I'm a former intelligence officer in um, intelligence analyst in the UK Customs Service and when I went to work for several years in Bosnia I remember um, seeing you doing a hard talk with the head of the Serbian Information Office in London and uh, that program should certainly have been... I, was, I think that was Tim Sebastian. Oh, sorry, I yeah. you did. Yeah, sorry, Wasn't me. Anyway, hard talk. Another ball guy. <laughs> be, uh, um, compulsory uh, viewing. Um, yeah, should I agree in, uh, entirely. Um, I worked 
leading into the question, I, I worked in Yemen a few years ago and for the World Bank, and um, I, I was very disturbed that when we tried to explain to them, look, you have to have a plan B, and here's a suggested plan B to deal with how we feel, can fulfill our work in relation to the growing unrest, how they weren't really ready for this, and there was an element of burying head in the sands, and that's not a criticism of Yemenis, that's a criticism of the World Bank. So leading into my question is, um, you mentioned how perhaps some of the indicators weren't picked up by just about everyone. Um, what things are appearing now for what next that you think are being looked at and perhaps recognised, and maybe are there any things where you and your colleagues believe are significant indicators for what happens next, but perhaps aren't being given the weight they should be? Well, I think people now are looking for things, so they probably are getting more, you know, they're getting more weight than they might have previously. Um, I would look at sectarianism, uh, the uh, sharpening split between Shia and Sunni, which since the catastrophic invasion of Iraq in 2003 has sharpened greatly, but the increasingly sectarian war in, in Syria is sharpening that again. And if you look at that fault line that runs through the region, that starts in Lebanon and goes down through Syria and Iraq and Kuwait and down the Gulf, uh, Saudi Arabia on one side, Iran on the other side too. Um, I mean, that is some, uh, I think, going to produce a lot of um, friction and difficulty. And I think that, that you know, one thing, uh, it's a grossly simplistic, but one thing that you can say about the region is that, in a sense, everything is connected with everything else. And through that, that network of connections and fault lines and so on, and Syria is important because it, it sits right on the, the convergence of quite a few of them, most of them really, uh, problems get transmitted. You know, it's what Israel has done today in Gaza, uh, assassinating the head of the Hamas military wing, you know, will that, will that inflame people who are in Jordan, who are anyway um, antagonistic about the Jordanian peace treaty with Israel, if they're in a mood to demonstrate anyway. Uh, it was interesting that, uh, that it was interesting today that the, um, the Freedom and Justice Party, the, the political party of the Muslim Brotherhood in, um, in, in Egypt, said they put out a statement saying that the people, the, the Palestinian people, will not be allowed to be oppressed by the Israelis in the way that they have been in the past. You know, it could be talk, but it was inconceivable that Mubarak would have said something like that. The Israelis are doing this operation in Gaza now uh, in a different world to the one in which they were able to do Operation Cast Lead either side of the new year of, two, of 2009. So there's a lot of uncertainty a lot of unknown unknowns, to borrow a very good phrase. And Israel, I think, has maybe not calculated how many unknown unknowns there are um, in, in taking this decision today to absolutely escalate its conflict with Hamas. But is it fair to say we don't know exactly what the situation is going to be two years, three years down the road, but we know that big change is coming? Yeah. Uh, the, the Middle the East will never be the same. No. And I think if it's, a, it's a, as I borrowed a phrase in the book, you know, I borrowed it from I do have a footnote and attribute it. Uh, it's, it's a, you know, if it's a five-act play, we're at the end of Act Two. Uh, you know, there's a lot that will happen and continue to unfold, and things will not be the way that they were, and things will change greatly from where they are today. I think that it's going to take a generation for, for a new shape to start emerging out of the mist. Some people are talking about redrawing of map and countries and borders and so on. Is this too far-fetched, do you think? Or well, I, 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 I sat with... Um, if, if Syria is broken Listen, up. I mean, four, three, four years ago, I sat with a top Hamas person in Gaza who, who receives people in a room in his house which has it's partly salon and partly garage because he has two four-wheel drives donated by the Qataris uh, facing 
automatic garage doors. The other end, there are sofas. I said, so why have you got the cars actually in the room with you? He said, in case the Israelis come, of course. <laughs> and, uh, and he picked up a, a globe. As I was saying to him, well, you know, the usual questions journalists ask, so where actually are you on the two-state solution? Would you accept a Palestinian state alongside Israel? He said, it was a background conversation, you know. He wouldn't have been quite so, so obvious, I think, on camera. He just dismissed it. He picked up the globe, and he pointed on one side to Nigeria. He put it on the other side to Indonesia. He said, look at everything between there. It's all Muslims. And, you know, so someday it's going to be one place. So it doesn't really matter where the borders are. Uh, I mean, he was looking over the very long term. But that's something one of the top people in Hamas had as an objective, certainly the way he expressed it to me. So borders imposed by colonial powers 100 years ago, will they last? Not necessarily. Oh, no. Yeah, some, some will. Egypt's been there for thousands of years. They're not going to give their borders away to anybody. But borders between a future Syria and parts of Lebanon, between, you know, who knows? Um, Gabrielle Rifkin, Oxford Research Group. Um, Jeremy, in your book, um, can we move to Syria, where you say perhaps the escalation of the civil war wasn't inevitable if Assad hadn't hit so hard in the first place against the demonstrators. But I wonder if we can think about was it was it inevitable, and could and what were the possibilities of it of trying to stop an escalation if the West had managed to um, work more closely with Russia and hadn't been so on insistent on Assad going right at the beginning? Well, on the first subject, um, you know, it's a bit of an inconvenient truth for some people, but it, it is true that while there were always people in Syria who'd say to you. Assad, all the Assads, anyone who's called Assad is a butcher. Uh, they only believe in blood, don't believe a word that they say. They don't believe in reform. They will never get better. The, old, the young guy is the same as the old guy. His brothers are the same. His cousins are the same. It won't. But there were many people also who would say, well, give them a chance. And I had this, you know, I, it became quite easy for us in that period, not so now. Give who a chance? Assad, Assad Jr., Bashar al-Assad. Uh, give him a chance that, that many Syrians that I spoke to certainly seem to believe that he would br bring some change. And I think that if at the very beginning of all of this, when those first demonstrations started in Dera, in the southern part of the country, uh, had instead of them shooting the demonstrators, had he actually, there was a speech, which I point to in the book, um, I think it was around the end of March, beginning of April. And there was real expectation because people, senior people around him, Shara was one of them, uh, had come out with statements saying that he will, he will announce something special. There's going to be some change coming. And people were expecting that th this was the moment we've been waiting for for 10 years. Bashar's been talking about this moment for 10 years. It didn't happen. Yeah, but, but that's partly because he saw what happened in Tunisia and in Egypt, and that's a slippery yeah, well that, and that's slope. What, yeah, that was the argument, slippery slope, slippery slope, but there were still some hopes that he might come up with something. So I think that it's not certain, but it's possible that if Assad had said, we'll start trying to make a deal here, he may have got somewhere, you never know, it might have spared the country this appalling war, which is getting beat, you know, getting more and more embedded into what's going on, and destabilizing the region. I don't know. I mean, it's a thought. That's why, it's, uh, and the, the other thing you said, what, the other point you made about the West. Yeah, instead of calling for Assad to go yeah. the beginning, if you come closer to Russia's position, where we had, let, let them work out their and perhaps, um, Well, we closed off options. Uh, the West certainly closes off options like that. Um, would it have made a difference? You know, I don't think Assad is going to go voluntarily. Whatever, whatever, whatever happens, that's the thing. Um, I certainly think that they would have given themselves a chance of getting some unanimity in the Security Council had they not pegged out that, that position. Um, I think that the... I have to say that the, the, we, the, we, the, the, the three Western countries on the Security Council have not managed to fully answer and fully address the point that the Russians make, which is if Assad goes 
What? Are things necessarily going to be better? You know, will the war stop? No, I don't think necessarily. It's not a magic bullet, you know, getting rid of Assad. The Western countries have not addressed that properly. And equally, uh, the Russians and the Chinese uh, have not addressed the point that Western countries make, which is why, if you say Russia and China, that you're after stability in the country, do you continue to arm a man who attacks his own people? They haven't answered that question either. Um, I, I mean, the thing is, it's horrendously split. The Security Council is paralyzed. Sectarian war is going full tilt. There's a sort of Lebanon scenario, Lebanon in the 80s scenario happening there at the moment, I think. But would it be fair to say that Syria is slightly different from the other countries where change has happened because they don't have any sectarian splits? Libya, Egypt, Tunisia, Yemen, mm -hmm. it's all Sunni. Whereas Syria, you have the Alawites who are terrified. And Christians. And the Christians. Who are terrified. Who are terrified. So you, have, you, you really have sex. You have people who are really scared of, what, of the alternative. Yeah, right. There's another question somewhere. Yeah. Hi. Uh, hello. Oh, sorry. So please go ahead. Okay, You've sure. You've got the microphone, um, you can speak. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Katie Engelhart from Maclean's Magazine in Canada. Um, you touched on a few of the historical parallels that people have uh, brought up to try to explain what's going on here. Uh, one was the Prague Spring, which you, I think, rightfully uh, dismissed as fairly unhelpful. Another analogy that people use is 1848 revolutions in Europe. And I think that's at least more helpful, though obviously a perfect analogy is not possible. Um, but obviously in those cases, uh, in 1848, we saw quite dramatic progress in, in some areas like France, and then quite dramatic backtracking. And a lot of things now that we attribute to 1848, like the abolition of serfdom in Russia, um, that actually happened you know, over a decade after the revolutions kicked off. I'm wondering if you think um, it, it, here we will also see you know, this, this pattern of dramatic progress and dramatic backtracking, and if so, uh, what you think leaders in you know, a concerned West will do about it? I think there was an illusion in the West to begin with <coughs> that somehow by some miraculous process, uh, the joy and euphoria of the likes of the fall of Mubarak would suddenly transform countries like Egypt overnight into Germany or Holland, you know, or Sweden. You know, it was not going to happen. Um, so parallels with Europe, I think, are always dodgy as a result. Um, I think that, we're, that, that the region is now into uh, a period of trying to find a new shape. Uh, I think a new politics. It, they're trying to discover politics in some cases. You know, you look at a country like Libya where there really wasn't any kind of civil society. Politi and now they're, they're, they're struggling to, to form governments after an unusually, unexpectedly successful election. Um, so I think that inevitably there will be some, a lot of well, the tide will go back and forth and there will be difficulties. And a, another reason for that is the economic problems that a lot of countries have. And the best example of that is Egypt. 700,000 new people enter the workforce in Egypt every year. The economy produces less than 50,000 new jobs every year. You add that to their existing problems, the fact that they've pretty much exhausted their foreign reserves, they're keeping going now on a big loan from the IMF, uh, the economy is in a terrible state. The population is growing. It's a very large population. It's very poor. They've now got a habit of protest. Uh, the chances of economic and political stability in Egypt over the next five years are, you know, not great. Please. Hi there. Uh, John Morgan, a consultant who works in the region. Uh, picking up a little on... on What's been uh, what's been discussed in the last couple of minutes or last few minutes around the future? Um, it was pretty clear in the case of all the successful and thus far partially successful revolutions what people have been against, and there's a lot of and, and you've alluded particularly to Sunni Shia split, but there's a lot of fragmentation in those societies: urban, rural, industrial, agricultural, old, young, etc there doesn't seem to be any sort of unifying theme yet as to what people want. So um, the fragmentation comes not only between classes and groups within countries, but between those countries um, and could lead to countries falling apart. Do you get a sense from people that you're talking to um, across parts of society and um, 
the non-Arab street or the Arab non-street. Um, do you get a sense from those groups that there are identities and platform politics developing and that people are getting a sense of where they want their societies to go, or is that still a vacuum? There is a sense of politics developing in different countries in different places. Um, I certainly think it's always much easier to agree on what you don't like than agree on what you want. You know, th what unified people in, in Egypt in January and February last year? Get rid of Mubarak. As soon as he went, what divided them? Everything. Uh, I think you can say the same about, about Libya. You can say the same about anywhere where they wanted to get rid of somebody, you know, the symbol. He went. But the thing is, that is not the solution. It doesn't get people jobs. I do think that um, a politics is emerging, and it, people, I think, are finding that now that the, those people, especially political Islamists who've been in opposition, and sometimes have been in jail, um, and now that in some cases they have to deliver in government, they're getting a slightly different attitude towards them. Because to start with, it's much easier to keep your, yourself pure, keep your beliefs pure, when you don't have to put them into, it's like being a Lib Dem in this country, you know. <laughs> Once you get into government, something changes. <laughs> You've got to make some nasty compromises. Will that happen with politicalism? Quite possibly. And actually, I've, been, I've sp spoken to numbers of people who've said to me, you know, pious Muslims who say, yeah, we voted for the Brotherhood, um, but uh, what they need to do, they don't, they don't need to tell us how to pray. We know how to pray. They need to provide jobs, better health care, um, end corruption, make things efficient. Otherwise, we might have to vote for somebody else. Um, so, yes, there are you know, things are emerging, and that's, I think, positive. I think the most positive factor of it all is, is the fact that people are taking responsibility for their own lives. And one thing about, you know, Arab countries, which it's a, you know, it's a sad truth, um, there is a bit of a tendency to blame other people for things that go wrong. Actually, in many ways, quite rightly, for some years, legacies of imperialism, colonialism. <coughs> um, There's a lot of blame for the West. Dictate, yeah, blame the West, blame the West. But it's interesting that, that in those demonstrations last year, a lot of them, they weren't blaming the West, they were blaming their own people. And say, we want change, we want no more corruption, we want freedom, we want liberty, we want some justice. Yeah, but speaking of those who blame the West, why did the West, I mean, you say at one point that the West had this idea that Arabs like strong leaders. Oh, yeah, I but think so. But that's getting the West off the hook, isn't it? Why did they support all these? Well, I also said that it was very useful for them to have these people because you have one address. You have a problem, call Mubarak. You have a problem in Tunisia, call Ben Ali, etc., etc. And even once Gaddafi came in from the cold, he was useful as well. And we saw that as well with the whole business of extraordinary rendition. Um, uh, into the, the, the dungeons of nasty countries. These people were very useful to the West because Western governments who would pay lip service to ideas of uh, mm. democracy, freedom, liberty, civil rights, human rights, you name it, free trials, fair trials, justice, institutions, would suspend all that when it came to dealing with places that were useful. And they sustained that belief by saying as well, well, of course, people like a strong man in the Arab countries. They like someone telling them what to do. Um, and while Arab countries are not the same as Europe and they don't have the same background and the same antecedents and so on, I think human beings around the world share something uh, very distinct. Which They share something, which is the idea is you want to be master of your own life if you're a human being. You don't like people actually telling you what to do. You want to be free. You want to be able to make decisions. You want to be able to earn some money and feel that there's a sense of fairness. That, that, but I think people have got to a point in countries, in Arab countries, where they felt however hard they worked, it wouldn't make a difference. Because there was corruption, venality, there was nepotism, the fact that they would be unable, however hard they worked, to be able to, to, to do well. And I think that makes people think, what the heck, we'll get on the streets. And they knew that all that was supported by the West, allowed to happen. And actually, the, it is remarkable that not more people blame the West. You mentioned one instance when somebody turned on you. It was a peaceful thing, and then he turned and he said, you know, yeah. it's a Western thing. But uh, isn't it remarkable that people 
didn't blame the West more? Well, they didn't in the moments of revolutionary euphoria. They tend to now, and they actually quite often blame Western reporters who are asking them questions. I, I, I find that the, the amount of anti-Western feeling is increasing exponentially. Uh, it's in, in Cairo now, it's really difficult to work. Uh, the, I would not go, except in very special circumstances, to poor parts of Cairo, some certain poor parts of Cairo, because you take out the camera, there's practically a riot, and there's always someone making trouble, and someone, and once someone says, you know, he's, he's, a, he's, you know, he's a Jew or something, or he's an Israeli, you're suddenly surrounded by 80 people shouting, and it's, we get a, a lot of anti-Western trouble now in a way which is new. Mm -hmm. And I find it very, it's really quite unusual these days to go to a story where there is disruption and difficulty in, certainly in Egypt and in other places, and not get threatened. I get threatened. We don't report, I mean, don't report it, but I don't report it, but uh, we frequently get nasty threats from people and how you have to sort of melt away and and try and get away. What do they you say don't get it from the Palestinians, actually, at the moment. What do they but, say to you? Oh, get out of here or we'll kill you. But why? Uh, because I think some of them are troublemakers who may be, you know, there's some people suggest that there, there are people who want to get the Western media out of there for whatever reason. I don't know. I think we're just convenient scapegoats, probably. And I think that life is difficult and you need someone to blame and there's a habit of trying to blame foreigners perhaps I don't know I don't know why it is but frankly when someone says that to me I don't say why is it that you want me to kill me <laughs> why is it that you're threatening me with a knife <clears throat> oh okay what's well, interesting I will leave in that case uh, the thing is all this will eventually affect the, those Arab countries relationship with the West they had a friendly relationship in the past and now we see in Egypt it slightly is not as friendly as it used well, to be. Well, Obama has said that Egypt's no longer an ally, hasn't he? Something like that. Wasn't that the phrase? Something like that. Something like that. Um, uh, no, it's changing. It's changing. And the, uh, the fact that it was quite clubbable, I think, in a way for Western leaders. They could go to a place and they'd get offered a nice whiskey probably at the end of the day. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's gone. And that's, you know, question here, question. Was the sort of secular nationalist period in uh, Arab countries a mere interlude? Are they going back to the you know you you, you read recounts of um, of Western travelers two hundred years ago turning up in Jerusalem, and if they tried to enter the mosques, having to get dressed up in you know native costume uh, to enter the mosques because otherwise they they face threats. Uh, and maybe even be killed. So, is up is the country is the region going back to a different kind of attitude and mindset? You know, you look at you you go stay in any hotel in the region, and you you zap through the channels on the TV, and after a while you'll find a black and white film from Egyptian film from the 60s or the 50s with guys drinking whiskey and women uncovered, uncovered. Or in the sixties ones, they're wearing mini skirts. And if you if you look at the um, you know the concerts recorded by great divas uh, from the fifties or sixties, men and women sitting together, everyone smoking, uh, barely a headscarf mini in sight. Skirts, yeah, the whole thing. And now and then you, you zap 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 through the channels, and you see modern soap opera <coughs> out of Syria or out of, uh, out of out of Egypt, and. The women are covered, the men are separate, they're not in the same room very often, unless they're getting a bit of a talking to from their wives. And, uh, and you know, it's a, there is social change. Certainly seems to be moving in that direction yeah. anyway in many, yeah, yeah. many countries. There was a gentleman here who wanted to. Okay, if, if the microphone moves that in that direction. Hi, I'm Will Stockdale, Salamanca Risk Management. Um, talking a little bit about how we've looked at things which can be tracked across the different revolutions and tried to come up with thing, uh, ways to explain why some revolutions move at different paces, some haven't happened yet. Um, and I want to say something which we haven't really spoken about is the strength of pre-existing civil society movements uh, in some of these countries. And I wonder to what extent you feel that particularly 
the existence of perhaps the UGTT trade union movement in Tunisia and then moving towards the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt and the fact that there were these pre-existing movements which could provide cohesion um, and momentum to movement once they got started and is that possibly a way of explaining why the revolutions in those countries were able to move at a quicker pace <coughs> and solidify themselves whereas in those countries where those movements don't exist were far more messy? No, I think that's a, that's a very good point. Um, that the countries where there was a civil society and where there were um, those kinds of structures, I think that that certainly gave uh, forms of modes of, of organization. And so people who were able to use social media were, you know, had already be, were accustomed to, 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 to talking to each other and organizing things. And in Egypt, there was a, 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 a long and you know, quite proud tradition of trying to organize um, movements against the, against the dictatorship. But uh, they hadn't they never quite got a, a mass following and what changed was that they got more of a following but yeah of course and you could see that you can see that now as well in countries which are, as they try and adapt to life in the new world it's it's there where there are institutions and where there's civil society there's something to hang on to um, whereas you know you look at Egypt um, Libya no civil society there was nothing the all the institutions as well were completely hollowed out by the regime. And when Gaddafi went, they went. So there's nothing. They're rebuilding from the bottom up. And that's really, really hard. Building, they're not even rebuilding, they're building in Libya. And that's very, very difficult for them. I mean, there's a small population, relatively homogeneous, a uh, great deal of money. You never know they might do it. But at the moment, they're struggling. But, you know, even in Tunisia and Egypt, there was a form of opposition. It existed. Maybe it was ineffective, but it was there. Yeah. So the, the culture of opposition actually was had a root. No, so it's a, it's a fact. Uh, Christopher Mitchell, independent filmmaker. Um, many, many possible questions, Jeremy. And as you say, everything in the Middle East is interconnected. So I wonder if I can ask you what uh, the best information you have <laughs> at the moment is on the likelihood of an attack by Israel on Iran. <coughs> well, I had an interesting conversation with a, a senior diplomat uh, who was involved, um, I won't say who it was or which country, who's been involved in this whole business. And he said, second term Obama, there are two scenarios. First scenario, and probably what he'll do first, is put a much better offer on the table to the Iranians uh, to give them an inducement to not stop enriching, because they won't do that, but to make an agreement that they won't enrich beyond a certain point. Certainly not to the point where they are, where, you know, because I don't know how, how closely all of you follow the whole business of u enriching uranium, but, but once you get to, I think, 20%, you've done the hard, the, hard gr the hard yards, and then it's just a question of doing it more after that. You've mastered the, the cycle. Um, so second term Obama, the scenario goes, okay, from this diplomatic source, is that puts the offer on the table, do the Iranians, threatened also by sanctions, pick it up and say, yes, there's a deal, we're going to make a deal on this. We've got something out of it, we've got enough. And then the pressure goes away. What if they don't? And what if the Israelis, as Netanyahu said at the United Nations at the General Assembly back in the end of September, uh, said the red line for them, he moved it, because the red line was supposedly this year, he moved it to next summer, and saying that they will get to that point. Candidate Obama, before the first U.S. elections that he, that he won, the last ones, last but one, in his first term, said, under no sir, he said this to AIPAC, the big Israeli lobby group in uh, D.C., he said, under no circumstances will I allow Iran to have a nuclear weapon. What if Iran, my source said, what if Iran, uh, by the summer, has rejected what appears to be the best offer that they can put on the table? And what if the Israelis are then saying they're on the verge of getting a nuclear weapon, we have to take action? Would the Americans then move as well and attack? Would they give Israel a green light to attack? My source said it's a credible scenario. I've speak, spoken to people at senior levels in the Israeli government uh, in the last few months who said to me that this was before Netanyahu, so it was, it was August I was speaking to them actually, before Netanyahu made that speech at the uh, UN General Assembly 
and they had this jargon, SQ, a sufficient quantity. And they said, we calculate that Iran will have one SQ to make up one sufficient quantity of uranium to make a bomb by the end of this year, 2012. Therefore, if we're going to act, we're going to have to act. They were quite serious about it. Um, I became BBC Middle East editor in 2005, and every year since then, there has been someone saying, this is the year of decision on Iran. Finally, it's all going to happen. I think there's a very strong argument for saying that it has 2013, it really will be. Uh, I probably said that would be in 2012. But, but 2013, it really will be because they have, you know, they've, they're at that point. Of course, the Iranians, I have to stress, say they don't want a nuclear weapon. And the supreme leader has said it won't even be, he's issued a fatwa against them. <coughs> Um, do you believe all that? Don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not would, sure what to think. Would you issue a fatwa for what you consider national security? Would you lie? <laughs> I don't know. But I mean, logically, I logically, from 2005 to 2012, they're getting closer and closer yes, they every are. year. So there has to come a point where they're close enough. I remember a British diplomat saying in a briefing in about 2006, a guy who at the time was uh, very senior and is even more senior now, saying. When I got this job, he said, at the time he was, had a senior job in the foreign office, he said, when I got this job, everyone said Iran was five years away from a nuclear weapon. If when I give up this job a few years from now, people are still saying Iran is five years away from a nuclear weapon, then we're doing fine. No one is saying Iran is five years away from being able to make a nuclear weapon, if they want to. Yes. Uh, as an adjunct to that question, um, <clears throat> Uh, there is a weaponry problem by going 200 <coughs> feet down. I, I don't think that it's, it's clear the Israelis have that kind of weaponry. They have overwhelming nuclear force. But let's consider another question about the Israelis. Uh, you were talking about this <coughs> united Islam. And um, uh, th there's also an interpretation from inside the Israeli uh, intelligence that, in fact, the, the neighbors are weakened by this. There's less cohesion among the, the, the neighbors. Uh, this move in Gaza might, suggest, might be attached to Netanyahu losing Romney as a candidate. Uh, but also it's quite audacious. Um, how does the balance of power look in terms of the Israeli army, which looked so bad during the second Lebanese in, in invasion? Uh, what do we have in the Israeli army now, and what do the neighbors, how, can they, uh, how cohesive are they? Well, I think when it comes to Gaza, 2009 war absolutely said that Hamas have got almost no military answers to the Israeli army and the Israeli Air Force especially. Uh, uh, so I think that the Israelis are calculating right now that they can do what they feel they need to do and they can get away with it as far as Hamas is concerned. Um, I think that there is quite a bullish mood in the IDF uh, about their capacity to take on their neighbors. They believe that they did screw up in the 2006 Lebanon war and they, have, they believe that they have sorted out the problems. And if you talk to them, what they all say, and I do talk to them every now and then, uh, what, they, what, they, what they say is, next time, if there's a war, if, if Hezbollah do anything, we're right from the start, we're going to invade, we're going to take the gloves off, they won't know what's going to hit them. We are not going to hold back in any sense. And if you talk to people in Hezbollah, as I do from time to time, in Lebanon, They'll laugh at that and say they're scared. Uh, we can, we have also realized the mistakes that we made, and we're now equipped to take them on. Is it talk on both sides? Who's bluffing? Who's bluffing? I don't know. I think there are enough people on both sides who believe it. Egyptians and Syrians have a fact of backing up extreme neighbors. Well, you know, I, I think it's still Syria and Egypt are, for different reasons, very inwardly focused at the moment, as is the BBC. Um, <laughs> why did I say that? This is good. <laughs> uh, everyone is inwardly focused. But no, they're, they're, that was a joke. Um, they're, they're, they're inwardly focused. No, it's not a joke. <laughs> the, um, I won't say anything else. The, uh, I don't dig in my holes any deeper than I have. Uh, the, uh, Syria and Egypt are inwardly focused. I'm not sure they would, the Egyptians will do much more than talk when it comes to, say, helping the Palestinians. Um, I think they're very cautious. The Muslim Brotherhood is very cautious. 
They've been going since 1928. They believe in doing things slowly. They're not going to get overexcited and run with the ball. They're going to do things slowly because they believe that they are making really important steps towards creating the society that they want. And they don't want to screw that up. Um, and that's why they will tolerate things for a time. Um, so I think that, um, I'm not sure what I think in many ways, because the fact is, it's a new world. And this is the first, what has started today seems to be the first significant Palestinian-Israeli crisis since the new world appeared. So we might learn something in the next few weeks. Oh, I think uh, about Israel in a minute, but one thing you can't say about the Muslim Brotherhood is that they're not patient. They are very, yeah. very patient. Israel, what do the Israelis make of all the change in the uprising? Do you think they like it? I think they hate it. I think the world is shifting under them and they really don't like it at all. And the, uh, you know, um, one um, top Israeli uh, opinion maker uh, said to me a few years ago, as a joke, but it was only half a joke. He said the first thing that the Israeli foreign ministry do every day is say a prayer for the health of President Mubarak. Uh, and I was, you know, he was making a serious point. They really relied on the guy. Status quo? Yeah. Um, it, Israel was comfortable with the status quo. And the, well, even the, Syria. I mean, it's, it's not just Egypt, is it? Were they, were they I mean, the, 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 the <laughs> shelling that has gone back and forth across the border uh, up Golan. north for the Israelis. Golan in the Golan is the, since 1970, since the 73 war and since the Disengagement of Forces Act that followed that, that Kissinger negotiated, it has been Israel's quietest frontier. It's the one they've worried about least. And now there's shelling going back and forth across it. This is for the Israelis, this is something which is deeply concerning. Uh, one Israeli writer, one columnist, uh, when Mubarak went, he referred to him as the cliff. He said, we regard Mubarak as the cliff, the cliff that protects us from the waves of, of, of Islamists and political Islamism and, and disorder and confusion. And now the cliff has gone. No, they, they, they're having to adjust to a new world and a new world that they find quite difficult. I asked the same question to an Israeli diplomat. Uh, and he said, we support democracy. And I, and I did quote, what yeah. you just said about the guy who said, we pray for the health of President Mubarak every yes, in the yes, morning, as yes, a half joke. Yes. And, you know, they can't admit that, that they hate what's happening. That's the dilemma that they're in. It's just like the Americans. They can't admit that they're terrified and they would have preferred the status quo. So they have to come out for democracy. Of course, which is Whether why. Whether they mean it or not. You know, um, Obama decided in about five days to break off a 30-year relationship yeah. uh, with Mubarak. And while it wasn't decisive in getting rid of, of Mubarak from his job, it certainly was a considerably weakening point. And I think the army's perception of, of Mubarak then changed. And the army was very important in forcing him out. Please. Um, Jeremy, I don't think you mentioned Turkey at all, which, uh, at least in the early days of the Arab Spring, had great pretensions to be the model and the leader and so on and so forth. <coughs> They've obviously come a bit unstuck in their handling yeah. of the Syrian crisis. But do you think Turkey is a significant power in the region now? I think that it's a, it's a really important power. Yeah, it is. Um, I mean, Turkey's foreign policy was no problems with the neighbors. Uh, David Olu, the foreign minister, came up with this quite simple doctrine, and it seemed to be working. You know, whichever way they faced, everything would be okay, and there would be a perfect ground to do business, and maybe ultimately have political influence. Um, I think that Turkey, whether it likes it or not, is involved. It has a 900 or so kilometer frontier with Syria. Uh, there are more than 100,000 Syrian refugees in Turkey. Turkey is effectively a party to the civil war in Syria now by backing the armed opposition. Um, th they have big problems with the neighbors, but they are acting as a, as a Middle East power. Plus, they, the, the, the prime minister has been quite very activist in terms of touring North Africa after the falls of the, the leaders there and, uh, and moving in. And you go around North Africa, Turkish business, Turkish construction, hotels, it's really, really um, significant. 
Turkish soap, opera, soap operas are immensely popular, yeah. uh, you know, dubbed into Arabic. Uh, so there are all kinds of reasons why Turkey is connected and why it will continue to be. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a player. Um, they're not quite sure which way they want to go. I mean, I, I, I interviewed David Tolu in, in New York at the, uh, at the General Assembly. And he was still pressing, you know, they're pressing very hard for uh, safe zones in, uh, in, in northern Syria. And I said, well, you go inside, you can go there, you set up a safe zone against the wishes, of, without a UN resolution and, and without the wishes of the, against the wishes of the Damascus regime. That's an act of war. And he said, and they denied he said it afterwards, it was of course a bit of a ruckus in Turkey. He said something along the lines of, to avoid r worse risks in the future, you have to take risks now. So I think that, uh, yeah, Turkey, are, they're important. How far is Turkey willing to go, do you think? Well, they don't do things on their own. They won't? No, no. But, but I think that willy-nilly, you know, they're essentially, they're, they're not that much far from being in a state of war with the Assad regime. They've traded shells. They're backing the armed opposition who are trying to overthrow the regime. Well, the talk is a talk of war, I mean, between the two. It's, yeah. It's terrible. Yeah. So they're willing to do anything? They're, they're not willing to move? We're not to willing because the thing is, is that Turkish public opinion is lagging behind that of the foreign minister and the prime minister in terms of intervention. There are plenty of Turks who are deeply concerned about the, the fact that their leaders appear to be hell-bent on dragging them into involvement in the Syrian war. They don't like it. It's not politically popular. Okay. I'm, I'm aware that there's... Um, annoyingly, while I've been waiting to ask my question, I've thought of another one. So, a very um, quick one, which is, um, is there any sign of unrest in Israel itself? Um, you've been talking about unrest in the rest of the region, but I'm just curious to know whether there's anything happening in Israel too. But the main question, um, the one I really wanted to ask, was about Syria. Um, you spoke about Assad not going freely. Um, you spoke about a generation of change. I mean, what, and, and the fact that each country is unique, even in that region, what do you think is going to happen in Syria? I think Syria is headed for um, a deepening war. And the way it looks at the moment, some kind of sectarian fragmentation um, and going through the sort of horrendous experience that Lebanon went through in its 15 year civil war um, with a capacity to, to destabilize other parts of the region. You're seeing it already, you're seeing it in Beirut, you see it in Turkey, you see it in Iraq. Uh, sectarian splits are going where the sectarian barometer is way up again in, in Iraq. Um, so that's why I see for Syria. Unrest in, in Israel, you mean unrest among Israelis or among Palestinians? Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, they had their own kind of version of the Occupy movement uh, somewhere or two ago in, uh, in, in Israel. Uh, which was deliberately didn't get involved in the issues of war and peace and the Arabs because that's quite divisive there. And they tried to keep it away from all that and kept it on more economic issues internally. Um, no, uh, what you have in Israel is at the moment is one quite popular prime minister, Mr. Netanyahu. Well, I think Syri Syri Syria is, the way things are looking at the moment, Syria is in, is in for a, uh, quite a protracted war and which will splinter the country. Uh, I hope I'm wrong, but that seems to be the most likely thing. Splinter the country and, and, and I have no idea what Syria emerges out of, out of that, a deeply wounded one. You know, Lebanon is struggling 20 years after the end of its civil war to digest the consequences of the civil war and to get over the the um, the scars of it. Twenty years on, they're still struggling to get over it. Uh, there was somebody else waiting. I, I have to. Um, yes, I'd uh, like I to did promise you at twenty past eight. Yeah, Should so we need to stop soon because I, I'm getting a bit worried about the ten o'clock news. one last question? Uh, my, my, my phone ran out of juice and it's been charging. One last so question, I know please. if my phone was on, I might be getting some messages. Uh, this is Kitty Logan. I'm a freelance journalist. Quick question, because it's partly been answered already. Where are you, uh, Kitty? What you kind of issues are the Syrian op is the op Syrian opposition now having? I, I see that President Obama tonight has again not officially recognised them. And the second part of my question is, what impact is this all going to have 
in Lebanon in the long term because we've already seen some problems there already. I think you touched on that. Lebanon is under the biggest pressure from uh, Syria. Lebanon, the Lebanon, there's so many links between Lebanon and Syria that inevitably, you know, they have a pos policy where I think they call something like disassociation from the conflict there, which I think is an aspiration. It's not a, they can't, you can't, they're too connected. Um, Syrian opposition. Um, I've spoken to dip Western diplomats this week who are very encouraged by the way that they made that deal in Doha. Um, but the, what the British and the Americans believe is that the opposition needs to pass a few tests and jump through a few more hoops before it gets the kind of backing that the French have given it. Mm. Well, look, I mean, we can talk about this for hours. I I'm planning to come back for a drink after the 10 if I, <laughs> <laughs> if the whole thing it's doesn't fall off here. here. But uh, th thank you all very much, and I'm terribly sorry for those who uh, had questions and couldn't yes. ask them. Uh, Jeremy uh, Bowen, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>